delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh unto the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son, Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother! And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst! Now there was a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished! And he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with the spices 
as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden and in the garden a new sepulchre wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus therefore because of the Jews preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to number 335. Cross of Jesus, Cross of Sorrow, 335. Cross of Jesus, Cross of Sorrow, where the blood of Christ was shed, perfect man on the dead suffer, perfect God on the as blood. Here the King of all the ages, throned in light world's good be. Crucified by sin for me. O mysterious condescending, O abandonment sublime, there God himself is buried of a suffering. Cross of Jesus, cross of sorrow, where the blood of Christ was shed, perfect man on the dead suffer, perfect God on the has pled. Our scripture reading is from the book of Revelation. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, if you'd like to follow along. Revelation chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, 
Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to 320. And let's stand to sing this. And as we are singing it, I will have to go and turn on the broadcasting equipment. Uh, so if you get to the end, just repeat the first verse. Let's stand to sing number 320, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Beneath the cross of Jesus, the
You may be seated. The message today is from Genesis chapter 22. You might wonder why would we preach out of the book of Genesis on Good Friday? Is because in Genesis chapter 22, we find given to us through the life of Abraham a picture of what happened on Calvary's cross. We find it taking place at the place that later would be the Temple Mount. We find it taking place at the location where the city of Jerusalem would be built. Genesis chapter 22, the message entitled, Not Withheld Thy Son. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham! And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it upon Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham! And he said, Here am I! And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said unto this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. 
and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. A powerful and moving narrative. I hope you can understand the agony of a father called upon to do the most painful thing in the world. I hope you noticed that God called Isaac three times Abraham's only son. Ishmael, who was of the flesh, did not count. There are many things that we need to learn from this very sobering narrative in Genesis 22. First, even though God knows what is in the heart of his children, and he can see if faith is resident there, God still allows his children to go through those terribly painful tests to prove to themselves and to the rest of the watching world that they trust him completely, explicitly, and even to the very gates of death. The text tells us that God himself put Abraham to the test. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. We need to understand something very important at that point, that God never tempts us to sin or to commit moral evil, but God does refine us with fire. God refines us with fire to test our steel, to test our love, our obedience, our commitment to him. Let me talk for just a moment about that phrase, God did tempt Abraham. How do we square that with the New Testament and the New Testament teaching on temptation and what actually happened to Abraham? The New Testament lays down some very specific divine revelation about temptation. First, the devil tempts us to sin. We see that in Matthew chapter 4, Mark 1, Luke chapter 4, which is the temptation of our Lord Jesus Christ by Satan in the wilderness. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Number two, we see the false teachers tempt us with unsound doctrine and twisted premises. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Number three, our temptations are common, but they are never unbearable. 1 Corinthians 10.13 promises, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Number four, God never tempts us to do evil. Instead, our sinful human nature is drawn into sin all by itself. James chapter 1. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's the evil response, that function of our old sin nature. The second thing that we learn from our passage today is God will often test us and our loyalty to him by removing the one thing or the one person that we love the most, that we love the best, to show that we love him even more. I've been through that. To clarify our own perspective on what is eternal and what is temporal. What is valuable and what is worthless. Verse 2, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Ask yourself the question, what is it that you are currently hanging on to and don't want to let go of? Think for a moment. You have something. What is it that you love most in all the world? Are you even afraid to bring it to your mind? Have you really given it to God? 
Have you really surrendered your will in that matter to God? Do you understand that you must release your heart from the person or thing that you love? Totally release it so that you can experience what God may or may not give you back. It's an important lesson for us to learn. God may not give us back something identical to what we released. In this case, God did give Isaac back to Abraham, but God may give you something that will draw you closer to himself that is totally different from what he took away. You will never know what God will give you until you completely surrender the center of your affections to him. Just remember, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Just like Abraham had to give his only son, whom he loved, the Father loved the Son from eternity past, and the Son loved the Father. It was a perfect love. It was an unbroken love. It was a love that had never been marred by sin. It was the greatest of all possible loves, and yet the Father and the Son, in love, gave what they loved most to make a sacrifice to redeem us from sin. The third thing that we learn in this passage is that the issue of making a complete sacrifice, a complete sacrifice. What's standing between you and making a complete sacrifice to the Lord? God expects the sacrifice that we, be, that we make to be complete. God not only told Abraham to offer up his son, but it was to be, did you get this, a burnt offering. That would absolutely preclude any possibility of medical help after the fact. Isaac was to be burned to ashes. You see, that foreshadows exactly what Christ would have to suffer when he suffered the pains of a burning hell for us. The fire that burns forever. Six times in the test that we just read out of Genesis, it emphasizes that Abraham was to make Isaac into a burnt offering. He doesn't say it once. God says it six times. A burnt offering. In the Old Testament, God gave specific commands concerning the burnt offerings. There are 190 verses in the Bible that speak of the burnt offerings. And within those 190 verses, there are 543 specific usages referring to burnt offerings. It's interesting when we see how many of those are in Genesis. You know, in Genesis, the six occurrences in our text today are the only time that a burnt offering is mentioned in the entire book of Genesis. To get the impact of what it means to be a burnt offering, let me just show you a few verses on how this plays out later under the law. The very first verse under the Mosaic Law dealing with the burnt offering was the whole burnt offering of a ram, just like the ram in the Abraham-Isaac narrative. Exodus 29:18, Thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Not merely was it to be done once, but the burnt offering was to be a continual intergenerational offering to the Lord. It was required if the people were to be able to meet with God. Exodus 29, 42. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. You could not come into the tabernacle of the Lord unless you had the continual burnt offering. The fourth thing that I think we learn from the burnt offering is that it gives a beautiful foreshadowing of the intergenerational promises given to the believer today. 
Just like the burnt offering was applicable to every succeeding generation, so we have great promises from God about the successive generations in the line of God's promises. Our children and our grandchildren. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, Peter says, For this promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Chapter 3, verse 25. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made you with your fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. That reaches out to us as Gentiles. Paul makes a very interesting statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, a chapter dealing with marriage and divorce, and whether or not a believer should stay married to an unregenerate. Paul says yes. Because, he says, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Fascinating, that word is hagioi. The word translated elsewhere in the New Testament as saints. Holy ones. Acts 11.14 Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? 16.31 They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. 16.32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. 16.34, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. There's some special promises to believers for the children. Chapter 18, verse 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Fifth, the burnt offering was to make an atonement for sin, and it was to be a male without blemish. Leviticus chapter 1. He shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. It shall be an accepted for him to make atonement for him. And if his offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or of the goats for a burnt sacrifice, he shall be a male without blemish. Verse 18 of chapter 4. And he shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord, that is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour out all the blood at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Oh, the pouring out of the blood. We read it in John, where Jesus' side was pierced with a spear, and how flowed all the blood and water. The cross gives us a picture of the brazen altar of burnt offering. He shall lay his head upon the hand of the goat and kill it in the place where they killed the burnt offering before the Lord, because it is a sin offering. Chapter 6, verse 12, And the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. It was a fire that never went out. Where the burnt offering was to be brought. Sixth, of the 543 occurrences dealing with the burnt offering, only one is found in the New Testament. That is, 542 of them are in the Old Testament, but one is found in the New Testament. It's found in the middle of the key New Testament passage telling us that Christ fulfilled the typological picture of all the Old Testament sacrifices. That fulfillment includes the sacrifice that Abraham was about to make of Isaac when God replaced Isaac with the ram for the burnt offering that God himself had provided. It's in Hebrews chapter 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Notice if, if it accomplished that purpose, they wouldn't have had to offer any more of them. Because that the worshippers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, speaking of Christ, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings, there it is, verse 6, And sacrifices for sin thou hadst no pleasure. 
Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that is, all those old sacrifices that he might establish the second, that is, the final and s the sacrifice of Christ. Christ completely fulfills the picture of the sacrifices. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus. Now he's going to say this three times here in this passage. By the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. It never has to be repeated. The Roman Catholic Church lies to you when it says it's offering the body and blood of Christ. That Christ is being re-sacrificed in the Mass every time the host is elevated. And the priest says in the words of the Mass, we offer unto you the only true and living God. And he claims that at that moment that cracker turns into the body of Christ, though same in form yet changed in substance. And that the wine, though it appears to be the same thing in form, yet has been changed in substance to the blood of Christ. He's lying. A blasphemous lie. Because the scripture says the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever, there it is, number two, sat down on the right hand of God. Dear friend, have your sins been forgiven by the one sacrifice of Christ? Have you come to the foot of the cross? Have you understand that God offered His only begotten Son? From henceforth expecting till His enemies be made His footstool. For by, and here's the third time, for by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's why we're able to come with boldness into the presence of God. God remembers our sins and iniquities no more. Verse 17, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Seventh, Abraham did not hesitate to obey. Abraham did not hesitate in this manifest incredible faith. He rose early. He didn't wait to see if something else would happen. He made all the necessary preparations, including the people who would care for the animal. When he went along with Isaac, he had to travel three days, time in which he could have reconsidered. He knew the exact will of God and didn't try to change it. His final words to the two servants prove that he believed that Isaac would be alive at the end of the test. Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. Plural. The plural would come again. The New Testament emphasizes that Abraham believed with all his heart that God would bring Isaac through the sacrifice alive because God had promised that to Abraham that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac was not married at this time. Isaac had no children yet. Therefore, because Abraham believed the word of God, the only option was that Isaac would make it back home alive even if he were killed. The New Testament says so. In fact, the event is one of the seven most essential proofs of the genuine faith of Abraham. It is, in fact, the capstone number seven proof listed in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 lists seven things that prove the faith of Abraham. And the capstone of that entire list is the offering of Isaac. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. There's, there's proof number one of his faith. By faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith Sarah also herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. Isaac appears on the scene, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. 
so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, having received the promises, having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they had come out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. What did Jesus say about us? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Here we are, Genesis 22. And he that had received the promises offered up his monogenes, his only begotten son, of whom it was said in that Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now listen to verse 19. That's what I just said. Here the scripture tells us it accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. When Abraham told his two servant boys, the lad and I are going to go over yonder and we're going to worship, and we are going to come again back to you. Abraham knew God had told him to kill his son. That's why Abraham took the knife. Abraham knew that God had told him, burn your son up on the altar. No hope for medical resuscitation. That's why Abraham took the fire. But Abraham also knew the promises of God, and Abraham believed the promises of God. He knew that even if he killed Isaac, God would raise him from the dead because God always keeps his word. Do you understand why this is a picture of Christ? Number eight, the heavy burden of the wood, consumable by fire, was laid on Isaac. Abraham didn't carry the wood. Abraham carried the knife and the fire. Isaac carried the wood. The one who was the intended sacrifice carried the wood. Even as the sin of the world was laid on Christ, he carried it. The one who was the actual sacrifice. Abraham carried the fire and the knife. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. You know, someday the fire will test all of our works as well to see whether they're gold, silver, or precious stones, or if they'll burn up as wood hay, and stubble. Ninth, Isaac knew the truth. Isaac knew that a lamb was needed for a burnt offering. You see, that event was long before the giving of the law with its complex regulations for offerings when Abraham and Isaac went to Mount Moriah. That was long before the giving of the law and the burnt offerings. And yet Isaac knew that a lamb was needed for the burnt offering. That means we need to understand that Isaac's knowledge extended all the way back to Abel, the very first hero of faith listed in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Isaac knew that the only sacrifice acceptable to God was an animal sacrifice, not the fruit of the ground, not human sacrifice, not anything else for that matter that might smack of human works. Perhaps it was in the mind of both Abraham and Isaac what God had done when he provided another ram, a sin offering for a man who rejected it. Genesis 4, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel unto his offering. 
But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? In other words, Cain knew better. And if thou doest not well... Now listen to this next phrase, it's very important. Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt have rule over him. That's verse 7 of chapter 4 of Genesis. That word translated sin in verse 7 is the exact Hebrew word used for a sin offering every place else, all the way through the Pentateuch. The sin offering would not resist being bound and slain. Cain, I've brought you a sin offering. You don't have to be a shepherd. I'll provide it for you, just like Abraham understood my son. God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. You see, that's the grace of God extended even to somebody as wicked as Cain. Sin croucheth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt have rule over him. God had provided a sin offering for Cain. When the offering of Cain's hands was rejected, that fruit... The sin offering would not resist being bound and slain, even as Jesus did not resist being bound and slain. In the same way, God has provided a sin offering for the sins of the whole world in the person of Christ, even though they reject it. In the same manner, Abraham believed that God would provide himself a lamb. Just as God the Son is portrayed as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Note carefully, he would not just provide a lamb. You read the text here. It says, my son, God will provide himself a a lamb. Isaac accepted the faith of his father. Isaac continued to walk with him to the mountain of sacrifice. Tenth. Moriah, the place of the sacrifice, was where the city of Jerusalem would be located at the time of the incarnation. In the same place that Abraham offered Isaac, God the Father would offer up his only begotten son. Genesis 22, 2, and he said, Take now my son, thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Mount Moriah was where Solomon built the temple. But Jesus was offered as Isaac upon one of the mountains of Moriah. In the continuous and ancient tradition of the Jews, they believed that the altar of burnt offerings in the temple stood upon the very site of the altar on which Abraham purposed to offer his son. Remember well that Hebrews is the only New Testament book, as we've seen, that speaks of the whole burnt offering sacrifice. Eleventh, Jesus and Isaac are the only two men in Scripture who are referred to as an only begotten son. The only two. Jesus and Isaac are both referred to as an only begotten son. Jesus is called the only begotten son of God five times in the New Testament. All in the writings of John who wrote his gospel and epistles to lead people to salvation through faith in Christ. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life through his name. Isaac is called the only begotten son of Abraham once. In contrast to the five times that Jesus is called the only begotten. We find those verses about Jesus, very famous verses. John 1.14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. 3.16, you all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.18 He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 1 John 4.9 And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And now the one place where it's used of Isaac in Hebrews chapter 11, the heroes of the faith. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, 
and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Do you understand why Isaac is a picture, a foreshadowing of Jesus? When Abraham did not withhold his only begotten son, he foreshadowed how God the Father would not withhold his only begotten son. Twelfth, the death of the ram was a substitutionary death, even as the death of Christ was a substitutionary death for us. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering. Here's the substitution. In the stead of his son. Christ's death is a substitutionary death for us, for our sins. Thirteen, the complete yielding by Abraham to God that one whom he loved most was the key that unlocked God's incredible blessings promised in Genesis 12. The blessings were there, the promises were there, but they weren't unlocked for ten chapters. They're first given in Genesis chapter 12. They're restated in Genesis chapter 15. They're restated again in Genesis chapter 17. But it's not until Genesis 22 that the promises are released. The complete yielding by Abraham to God, that one whom he loved most was the key that unlocked those blessings. That extend down to today a permanent landed inheritance, an innumerable posterity, a nation, and the promised Messiah from his loins. Finally, note well, let me give you just a few practical take-home lessons. It's not enough to have accurate theology. If theology doesn't transform your life, there's something wrong. Because what you believe, if you really believe it, will transform your life. That's how we tell someone who is not saved, but if they trust Christ, how he'll change their life. And you know whether or not they've trusted Christ in their heart, because it does change their life, doesn't it? Let me give you some take-home lessons for the practical Christian life. I think it's very surprising that in verse 19, after all these remarkable events, Everything appeared exactly the same as before. Did you note that? Look at verse 19. Nothing changed. Nothing spectacular happened. There were no additional visions of angels. There were no charismatic experiences. Life didn't get easier. Abraham did not get a new palace at Jerusalem. Abraham still had to live with a difficult family and struggle along with a difficult life. And his relatives which are in the very next few verses, 20 to 24. They continue to live their normal lives, having kids and living the same mundane lives that they'd always lived before and living in sin. And one of them's got a concubine and it lists that for you in verse 24. Everything was totally unchanged in his family's life by his spiritual experience. I think that should be a reminder to us that even though something supernatural and invisible occurred in our lives the moment we trusted Christ for salvation, and it did supernaturally transform us inside, we shouldn't just automatically assume that there will be some kind of a visible manifestation of emotional display, ecstasy, speaking in tongues, being slain in the spirit, or other public display of contemporary exuberance accompanied by strobe lights, pounding drums, and swaying worship leaders up on the stage. You see, for Abraham and Isaac, the test that God gave them was truly emotional. You can't deny that. It couldn't have been anything less than emotional as God stretched them to their very limits. But the issue of the test was not emotions. The issue of the test was not feelings. The issue of the test was not whether or not there was a warm, fuzzy spiritual experience. The issue of the test was faith and obedience not public display. Even the servants weren't there to watch them pass with flying colors. They were still back with a pack animal. It was only Abraham and Isaac that walked quietly forward in faith. That's how Jesus went to the cross. The disciples were worried and afraid, but they followed. Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. He knew what was coming, but he had come to do the will of the Father. He, like Isaac, 
was a willing sacrifice. He himself said that if he wanted to avoid the cross, he could call for more than 12 legions of angels. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? After these events for Abraham and Isaac, life continued as normal in the temporal sense. But at the precise point of the test, when Abraham passed the test, God had chosen a man. God had given a test to that man. Abraham passed the test because of the two key character qualities of faith and immediate obedience. That's precisely why Abraham is honored in the New Testament as the example for us. God calls us to faith and to immediate, not delayed, to immediate obedience. Not delayed obedience, not obedience after our intellectual curiosity is satisfied, not slow obedience, but immediate obedience. That's why Abraham and Isaac portray for us what Christ did for us on Calvary. God the Father offered up his only begotten Son as a sinless sacrifice to pay for our sins. And the Son obeyed immediately. Don't forget another very obvious thing as well. Not only Abraham passed the test, Isaac passed the test too. It's incredibly important that Isaac, as well as Abraham, pass that test because Isaac is the prophetic foreshadowing of Christ. Abraham is the prophetic foreshadowing of God the Father at the time Christ was offered as the sacrifice for our sins. But Isaac is the foreshadowing and picture of Christ, God the Son. Now remember, Isaac was a strapping young teenager at this time. Isaac was well able to understand what was happening. He was well able to say unto himself, This doesn't look good. I'm out of here. I bet I can outrun the old man. But if Isaac had done that, he would not have been chosen as a prophetic foreshadowing of our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. Isaac willingly allowed himself to be bound and tied to the altar, just as Jesus willingly let himself be bound and nailed to the cross. Practical question. What do we miss when we're afraid of being in the center of God's will? Even though life continued as normal in that temporal sense, something invisible had happened that didn't appear on the surface. The history of the world had just been changed. The world didn't know it yet. The devil and his demons didn't know it yet. The angels probably didn't know it yet. But the unborn generations of Isaac were determined for prophetic fulfillment. A specific genetic line of faith, not flesh, was established for the coming of the Messiah. Even with those unbelieving relatives mentioned in the next few verses, God was preparing among them a bride for Isaac, who had submitted himself for the sacrifice. It was not until after these things that we read, verse 20, and it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, and Bethuel begat Rebekah. God was preparing a bride for Abraham's son. Just like God prepared a bride for his son. The bride is the church called out from those pagan relatives. <laughs> Do you remember how Isaac submitted himself to be bound even though Isaac knew they were on a mission to offer sacrifice? Remember, that's how Jesus submitted himself to be bound, even though he knew that he was on the path to the cross. John chapter 18 tells us, As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom seekest ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you I am he. If ye therefore seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, that he spake of them which thou gavest me, I have lost none. And down to verse 12, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. He was willingly bound. He was willingly led to the altar. He was willingly led as a sacrifice to the cross. As the sinless Lamb of God, Jesus completely fulfilled all of the scriptures concerning his death at Calvary including the prophetic types as well as the prophetic foreshadowings that we read here in Genesis 22. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. 
and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We've only scratched the surface today. We've only had a, a tiny glimpse of the magnificent glory and grandeur of Jesus Christ, foreshadowed in the sacrifice of Isaac 2,000 years before. A willing sacrifice. A sacrifice in the prime of life. A sacrifice who was an only begotten son. A sacrifice that goes all the way back to the moment that Abraham in faith, with tears flowing down his face, raised the knife to heaven, and the angel of the Lord called out, Avraham, Avraham, by Yomer Hineni, and he said, Behold, here am I. God said, Abraham, don't hurt him. I know, I know that you love me more than that boy. Oh, Father, what an incredible offer of sacrifice. And you provided yourself a lamb for the burnt offering. Father, we pray that in this moment each one of us might offer up to you and mean it, that which we love most, that what we desire most, that which we want most. And not try to take it back. We ourselves are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And we're not to be transformed to the world, but with the renewing of our mind into the image of Christ. Father, we give it to you. If you choose to give it back to us, we thank you. If you choose to withhold it, we thank you. If you choose to give us something different, we thank you. Because you are conforming us by what you do in our lives to the image of Christ. And so, Father, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>